Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible, praise God, is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, it is a joy and blessing, a privilege and honor to be back with you today for another dose of the Word of God as we feast upon the great things that He wants us to learn through His Holy Word. We're continuing our study in the book of Romans, and today we're going to pick up where we last left off in chapter 5. Now, Paul says, therefore, so based upon everything that I have said so far in this letter unto you, the young believer, because of this, I want you to understand that you have been justified by faith. Now remember, Paul is writing to Jewish believers. In other words, Paul is writing to people who now are followers of the Lord Jesus, his ways and his commandments, and they are putting off what they have been taught their whole life. And so Paul says, you're not justified by the law, but you're justified by faith, a simple obedience unto the Lord Jesus. And because of this, we have peace with God. That is what the Jew always sought. Friends, that's what you and I ultimately seek, to be at peace with God. We know that when we resist him, when we rebel against him, when we continue to act in our spiritual childish ways and behaviors, that we are not at peace with him. Just as an argumentative child is not at peace with their parent. The only way to be at peace is to be reconciled, to be obedient, and not simply to just be obedient, but to understand the importance of the obedience. And so Paul says we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by what Jesus did for us. Now, I don't know if you've ever stopped to think about this, but I want to alert you to a fact that had not Jesus laid down his life for us some 2,000 years ago, had he not submitted unto death, he would still be alive today. Because the wages of sin is death. And there was no sin in him or upon him. Therefore, death could have never had its way with him. And so he willfully gave his life for us. That's why they beat him so cruelly is because they didn't understand how he would not die. Any man under the same subjection of torture would have died long ago. And I think that's one of the things that Mel Gibson captures in his movie, The Passion, when the soldiers are beating him with the cat of nine tails, you can see the fury in their faces. And the more they beat him, the more furious they become because they want to be the one that kills him. They want their final lash to be the one that takes his life. But they couldn't take it. He had to lay it down. And because he laid it down for you and I, we have peace with God. Jesus is the bridge to our reconciliation. And not only through Jesus do we have peace with God, we have access into the Holy of Holies, into the very presence of the Almighty himself, by faith into this grace wherein we stand. There is a consistency in our service unto our Lord. We stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now, the hope of the glory of God isn't simply what is to come in the next life. The hope in the glory of God is what is found in Philippians chapter 1, where we are told that we can be confident in verse 6 of this very thing, that Jesus, who has begun a good work in you by his Spirit in your life, will continue to perform the act in you of creating you into the image of Jesus, chipping away all the things of self and the nature that you were born in, causing you to be more humble, causing you to be more kind, causing you to be more giving, causing you to be more submissive, causing you to be more obedient, causing you to be more surrendered, like the person of Jesus. And he will continue to perform this until the day that Jesus Christ returns. 
And that's what Paul is saying in chapter 5 of Romans, verse 2. We stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God that he's still working on us. And every day is a new opportunity for us to become a little bit more like Jesus today than we were yesterday, hallelujah. And we understand that God does this through many forms, through many fashions. And if we truly understand how God has worked with his people throughout time, we understand that it is the pressures and the trials of this life that God hones us into the people he wants us to be. And so we not only glory in the hope that God is going to continue to work on us and has offered us eternal life with him, but we glory in verse 3 in the tribulations through this life that he brings unto us, knowing that these tribulations, that these trials, that these pressures works patience. Now, when it speaks of tribulation in the Greek, it implies a vice. So if you were to take a melon and put it in a vice and begin to wind the crank, the more you wind, the more pressure you apply upon that melon till eventually it bursts and what remains inside the vice continues with the pressure being applied from both sides until it is literally squeezed into nothingness. And that's what the trials of life do for us. But they don't squeeze us into nothingness. They simply squeeze out everything that does not belong as a child of the living God. And these tribulations, through these tribulations, we become patient. Now that word patient simply implies steadfastness, constancy. As we stand in that trial and we remain faithful, trusting in the Lord to do his work in us, to teach us as we endure that suffering, that endurance leads us to experience. Now experience isn't what we would think. It's not that we're learning something, but it's God is learning something about us. That word experience in the Greek means trustiness or trustworthiness. And so God is seeing that as we stand faithful in the trial, that he can trust us with even greater things, greater rewards and greater trials. Because the greater the trial, when we come out the other side, the more we look like Jesus. And as God now places more trust in us, relies upon us, counts on us, that leads to hope, which is a confident expectation that God will be faithful even in the darkest of times. And hope doesn't make us shamed in verse 5, because the love of God, the care of God, the protection of God, the provision of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost who has been given unto us. And when we were yet without strength, when we were morally sick, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Jesus himself said he didn't come for the righteous, but he came for the unrighteous. He didn't come for the healthy, he came for the sick. Now there is a possibility that a righteous man in this life would give his life for a good man. But you see in verse 8, God loves us to such a degree that he didn't die for those that are good, and he doesn't wait for us to become good to offer unto us his forgiveness. He meets us in our sin, that while we are yet sinners, Christ dies for us and offers us his forgiveness. Much more then, being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. What wrath? The impending judgment that every man deserves. And God doesn't give us what we deserve. He placed that upon Jesus at Calvary. Jesus took our punishment. Every time he was spit upon, every time his back was slashed open, every time he was struck in the face, every nail that pierced his body should have been ours, friends. But he took it on our behalf because of his love for us. And so God's fury, God's justice for us was met when Jesus endured it all. Think of it like this. If you're angry and you took a baseball bat in the middle of your anger and you went out and you began to beat the side of a tree, you can only do that so long before all the emotion that has been bottled up within you is passed from your body 
as you strike that tree each and every time. And it's only going to be a short matter of time where you are spent. You have nothing more to give. Everything has been released. And that's what God the Father did to his son Jesus. All of his fury, all of his wrath, all of his anger was poured out upon Jesus, an innocent man. And Jesus, our Savior, because he loves us so, took every measure of God's wrath so we would never have to endure it, friends. Oh, we could spend the rest of our lives trying to contemplate what that truly means and yet fail so miserably. But the verdict of our being guilty and the consequences that should have followed, the punishment that should have been placed upon us, all of it was placed upon Jesus. And he did it for us. Oh, may God open our eyes and help us to understand what that truly means. May our spirits be enlightened and awakened to the weight of that truth, friends. Because when it is, our lives will be changed forever. And so Paul continues in verse 10, he says, If when we were enemies, we were reconciled unto God by the death of his son, how much more being reconciled now shall we be saved by the life, by the resurrection power that Jesus left the grave with? And so not only do we glory in the tribulations that this life brings unto us, as we were told in verse 3, not only do we glory in the fact that God is constantly working within us to cause us to be more like his son, but we also joy and glory in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom now we have received the atonement. We have received the process of becoming his friend rather than his enemy. For even as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world and death by sin, so death has passed upon all men because all have sinned. And we would not know sin had it been not for the law. And Adam, knowing the law of God, breaking the law of God, every man has been cursed since then. But just as all men receive the curse, all men can receive the blessing, the free gift in verse 15. For if by one man's offense many be dead, how much more by one man's sacrifice grace should be offered to all, all that would surrender, all that would receive it. And that's what Paul is explaining in the following verses that will bring us into chapter 6. As we are told in verse 19, as by one man's disobedience, Adam, Many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one, Jesus, shall many be made righteous. For by where sin abounded upon the earth through the lives of men, grace through the life of Jesus did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. And so Paul uses this to segue into his next thought by asking the question, if you truly understand the price that Jesus paid, if you understand the wrath and the judgment and the justice that you have escaped because of what he did for you, how can you continue in sin? How can you, realizing this truth, you that have been made dead to sin, how can you continue to live any longer therein. And that's where we'll pick up together next time, friends. But I pray that God the Holy Spirit concretes that question in your soul, in your mind. How can you as a follower of the Lord Jesus hold on to, admire, adore, passionately pursue the things of this world and not turn all of your affections upon God? not hunger and thirst for righteousness, not deeply need and crave his holy word. It says, Jesus said, you will know them by their fruits. No fruit, there's no confirmation. There's no witness to their confession. Thorn bushes don't produce grapes and grape vines don't produce thorns. If there's a willful practice of sin in your life, then you are not what you claim. But if you're a true follower of the Lord Jesus, completely surrendered to his will, 
then you will understand that the same resurrection power that brought him out of the grave has delivered and freed you from the bondage of sin so that you no longer live therein. Well, as I said, we'll pick up there the next time that we're together. And I would strongly encourage you to read Romans chapter 6 because it is so full of truth. It is so full of resurrection power. And the more acquainted with it, the more your journey will be blessed. Well, I'm so honored that you joined us today, friends. And I offer this prayer for you that Paul offered for the Ephesians in chapter 1, verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you, my friend, the spirit of wisdom, which simply means that you will learn how to govern your relationship with God, that he will give you revelation, which is simply that he will unveil the person of Jesus unto you, that the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened and open to new truth, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance is in the saints, what the exceeding greatness of his power is to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you. I'll see you on the next video.